focus on a particular example. So we have been, uh, um, uh, I don't know, been on time, but a little bit late. <laughs> so let's start right now. The floor is yours. Laura, thank you very much. Oh, let's see. All right. Um, hi, everyone. Good to see everyone again. Thanks for everyone who joined yesterday. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the work that we've been doing, specifically looking at a particular case study um, with similar methodology that I discussed yesterday that I'll also describe here. So if you weren't here yesterday, it's all good. Um, I've been doing most of this work with Anhao, um, and we're working on getting this written up, so we'll see. Uh, but I'm happy we're still in the writing process and working with some um, data analysis. So if anyone has any ideas or thoughts or is interested in collaborating, we're happy to, to work with anyone. Looks like somebody on hell are you co-host by any okay. chance? Does she make you co-host? Otherwise, I can admit. Okay. It seems that I'm not sure. Okay. That's fine. We should be okay. Oh, yes, yes, no, yes. Okay. Um, so the talk is titled, Did Cross Time Scale Interference Fuel the Three Year Long La Nina? Um, and what did this, what does this is what does this mean and what does this look like? Mm -hmm. Advance. All right, so we were in a La Nina event from July 2020 through February, end of February 2023. Um, and either within or before there was um, this coinciding with two other climate phenomena, specifically a positive Indian Ocean dipole event or positive IOD and an Atlantic Nino. Um, yesterday I talked a little bit about the IRI data library. Um, and so I just wanted to put a map up here from the IRI data library in case you're interested. Um, and then I highlighted part of the link. So if you just go to that link, um, you can kind of see and use these map rooms, but if you can see, you can type in any of any date that you're interested. This is specifically sea surface temperature anomaly. So um, just, a, yeah, if you're interested in learning more, that's how you get to the data library. Um, but we can see here that we have our negative anomalies. This is for October 2021. I pulled um, just, I pulled this map just as an example. And we can see, we see the La Nina. Um, and then we also see the Atlantic Nino um, and the IOD had been, event had, had passed at this time. So but this is just an example of what the data library is able to do if you're interested in using it. This is a product of um, the International Research Institute for Climate and Society. Um, they have a big data library that houses a lot of data um, and a lot of information that you can easily visualize without coding um, anything. So if, yeah, it's, it's an interesting tool. Um, but this is like what we were looking at within this three year long time period. And um, I'm gonna give a little bit of context as to why the Indian Ocean Dipole and the Atlantic Nino are important and you know what research has gone into this already. Um, so people have been researching and understanding what causes multi-year and so events. So this is not something that hasn't been looked to into the literature. Um, for example, Kim and Yu, who published in 2022, said that multi-year events are um, controlled by developing seasonal intensity, um, pre-onset Pacific conditions, and maximum zonal location of the anomalies. Um, like yesterday, I have the citations in the corner there on any of the slides that have citations in the QR code. So if you're interested in seeing more, you can go to the citations and see all the citations. Um, so folks have been looking into this. Um, this specifically came out after the two-year-long La Nina event, and they had been doing some research, so feel free to look into that more, but I don't want to spend too much time. Um, however, this paper by Hassan et al. in 2022 specifically looked at this event that we saw, um, and they have this beautifully constructed diagram um, describing how the El Nino event or the La Nina event kind of was encouraged initially initiated and how it um, was prolonged. And they talk about this positive IOD event and just general Indian Ocean basin warming. That's what IOB is, um, as well as interaction from the Atlantic Nino and, and some other general sea surface temperature warming. 
Um, and they describe the process as like the warming within the Indian Ocean Basin and the IOD caused easterly wind anomalies in the Pacific Ocean and combined with the Atlantic Nino low pressure system that moved eastward um, allowed for these easterly wind anomalies to move and propagate into the Pacific Ocean Basin, perpetuating the La Nina event. Um, so this is what their analysis was. Um, and you feel free to read more, but they have it all laid out and they had made some um, composites looking at uh, similar years where we saw these positive IOD events and um, what, you know, what, what that, what the conditions were for those in those composites. Um, so we were interested in understanding, okay, so we have, we have, let me kind of go back, we have this diagram. Um, but what exactly, we kind of see this IOD out front first, right? We have this El Nino that was finishing at the time, which I'll show in a minute, but we have this IOD here. So what exactly caused this IOD? Why is it there? Um, a lot of the time, IOD events don't necessarily, um, they they tend to follow and so and what it does, but we know that it they have it has its own internal variability. So what exactly is going on and why did this IOD event persist like it did, and we'll get to that in a minute. Um, and so why was it there? How did it get there? And how did it persist, right? So the IOD event lasted several months um, and sometimes really high amplitude. Um, so why exactly was it there? Um, and there have been some people that have said, okay, this is why IOD happens. There are several theories, you know, you have the, the typical ENSO, you have Folks saying the Indian summer monsoon may impact IOD activity or the boreal spring convection over Indonesia and the Western Pacific. Um, but there are some um, folks who've done a little research into the Madden Julian oscillation or the MJO. Um, and so this is what we decided to focus on for um, just looking and assessing how the MJO may have impacted this particular event. Um, and so we wanted to just start off very basically understanding, was the MJO active? Was it in a particular phase? What was the MJO doing? Do we know if we, can we say that it caused this IOD event, this positive IOD event? And then in addition to causing it, did it interact with the IOD event somehow? Did it fuel the event? Did it stall the event? Did it terminate the event? What does that look like? Um, and so these are just some of the things that we were looking into, mainly focusing on the in initiation and, you know, early stages of the IO the positive IOD. Um, oh, I forgot to say again at the beginning of the seminar, if you have any questions, feel free to interrupt or if something is unclear, just let me know and we're happy to take um, any questions. Um, so first, a very basic analysis, we wanted to see if there is any relationship between the IOD and um, the MJO amplitudes, so, right? If the, the IOD is monitored through the dipole mode index, which you can find through NOAA, um, you can find it in the IRI data library. Um, and then also the MJO amplitude, you can also find in a variety of sources. But we were looking at correlation when we were only in specific phases. So we filtered the data so that we were only looking at MJO phase one and then looking at how the IOD amplitude was also, well, how it correlated. And we found there was a relationship, a positive relationship that was um, statistically significant um, with MJO phases one and eight, um, and then a negative relationship with MJO phase six. So we were thinking, okay, there's something going on with phases one and eight um, that has some sort of relationship with the Indian Ocean Dipole. Um, so that's where we started. We, I looked at the wheeler hendon diagrams. I'm not sure how familiar everyone is. I know I explained a little bit yesterday how these work, um, but just for anyone who's unaware, the big triangles at the top, bottom, and both sides represent different locations. So you have the Western Pacific, the maritime continent, the Indian Ocean, and the Western Hemisphere in Africa. And then as the MJO moves around, you the world it moves around these circles so like you would expect to see it move kind of in like a circle like this how it has here um and if it's inside the small circle in the middle it means it's inactive but as soon as it leaves the small circle it becomes active and the farther away it is from the circle the more um more strength it has 
So you'll see like larger convective um, storms and such. Um, so we took a look and we started to notice this pattern, this pattern of um, the relationship that we saw before, but specifically with MJO phase one. Um, we see in May, we have some time both in eight and one, um, where the MJO is spending a lot of time at relatively moderate to high amplitude, I would say, just hanging out over here. Um, this must not be right. It must be like 10 days or something. I must have <laughs> missed that. But um, we see that there is this relationship here with um, phase one. We also look in, in July and we see that the MJO, aside from being within the unit circle for the month of July, which is a little hard to see the colors, but the MJO like hangs out in phase one in the month of July for 15 days, um, varying in, in strength. Um, as then as we move to September, we see that um, we have this really strong few days of the MJO in phase one. So this leads us to believe like there is something, at least me to believe, that there's some relationship whether the MJO impacts IOD or the IOD is impacting the MJO in phase one specifically. And then finally, once we get to October, which I'll, I'll show in the next slide, October is when we really are in the strong event. We actually see here, if everyone can see my pointer, the MJO is moving backwards into phase eight and then coming back into phase one. So there's some very strong relationship between the IOD when it's in a strong phase, positive phase with how the MJO behaves. Um, and so we decided to kind of think about how these months align. Um, as I mentioned before, ENSO phase usually tracks with the Indian Ocean Dipole. And so you'll see, you know, positive ENSO, positive IOD, but we can see here that um, the ENSO, the positive ENSO event, El Nino ended in, in July, but the strongest IOD time period was between September and the beginning of December. So um, you know, we have this internal variability showing. And then I also highlighted these months where we saw these kind of very active phase one MJO um, events happening. And so we decided to specifically focus on May, July, and September for the rest of the analysis, just to better understand how um, the MJO was contributing and potentially leading to this extremely um, strong event that we see in, in this fall of 2019. Forgot to mention this is 2019. Um, yeah, so yeah, was, if you have any questions, we can talk more about this. But what we chose to do was first just create, looked at the anomalies of what the sea surface temperature was doing during this time. So we have this first panel is May, the second one is July, and the third one is September. Um, and we can see that there is, you know, some warmer, we see that we see the primary shape of the positive IOD events, especially starting in July and September, warming in the western part of the basin, even visible in May. Um, we see this interesting cooler anomaly towards the Horn of Africa in July, which I'll get to in a minute. Um, but if we think about how the sea surface temperature is looking and how the MJO might impact it, um, we, we can think about it, and we'll talk a little bit more about this, but just understanding where the precipitation is during MJO phase one, um, we can see that it is mostly hanging out over the central part of just like south of India, kind of southwest of India here. So just kind of keep this, keep this in mind. Um, but this is what the observations look like for this time. These are just straight observations for the anomalies, sorry, anomalous observations. Um, so again, like I described yesterday, um, we made composite maps for each phase of the IOD and each, so let me, let me start again. So we looked at each phase of the IOD, positive, negative, and neutral, um, which is defined here. So anything within the, the DMI, dipole mode index. If it was greater than 0.4, we considered it positive. Um, less than negative 0.4, it's negative. And these, I believe, are set um, by NOAA. This is the pretty standard definition for IOD events. Um, using sea surface temperature data from NOAA as well. 
Um, here's another way that you can earn, interact with the IRI data library if you're interested in visualizing data in this way. Um, you can see this is just the dipole mode index, um, just different ways to visualize time series data too. Um, and then for, for completeness, the sample size for this time period, which is a little bit different, 1981 through 2021, was um, 3,680 days. Keep that in the back of your mind. Um, yeah, so for the composites, we have nine of them, a um, little bit different. So the thing I forgot to mention about the Matt and Julian oscillation is anytime we're within the unit circle, um, we consider that, let me, let me just go back. So anytime we're within this, this ring here, we consider that to be a distinct and different phase, phase zero is what we call it. So this is um, when it's inactive. So we're just giving it a name. That's how it's easy for us to um, categorize into the different phases. Um, yeah, so we have our phase zero, phase one, two, three through eight. Um, and it's a little hard to read, but we have the number of days um, that each phase exists. So this one is like 340 days, I think, here is phase one, which is what we'll be focused on. But overall, within the 40, 30 year period, no, 40 year period that we had, there were only 442 days in the positive phase of the IOD. So um, most were in the neutral phase, so over a thousand or so. Um, but we can see how the different MJO phases modulate rain or sea surface temperature um, patterns, you know, how they're different with each phase during positive IOD events. We can take a minute to look. I think it's kind of interesting. You can see how different phase six is, for example, compared, compared to phase one. Um, and some have, oh, the white, where it's white versus colored is statistically not significant. Um, yeah, so we're specifically going to be focusing on phase one, which I think I have here in a bigger picture. Um, and what we did is we compared phase one to several, the three months that we looked at, and we found that it was most similar to the July composite, um, statistically significant correlation of 0.74, I believe. So um, pretty similar. And then this is the positive IOD and the um, correlation was 0.7. So similar, um, but we find that it's most representative of this July, um, what we observed in July. Any questions on the composites? Any questions in general? This is still ongoing, ongoing research, um, but uh, we do have some ideas and thoughts about why we might see this cooling, um, which is something we see this nice cooling. I think I talked about it here when we we're looking at the observations. Um, we do see it generally a, a tiny bit when we're in the positive, if we just make a positive IOD composite, but we see that it's a, a bit bigger spread um, when we're looking at the um, joint composite or we're conditioning the IOD on every MJO phase. Um, and we think that this might have to do with how the convective scheme would work. You know, if the MJO is active um, just southwest of India and in this region, um, and the general movement in an IOD event is the water is moving, warm water is moving toward the western part of the basin, we're going to see this movement of this water here, but that water is going to have a lot of convection above, so it's going to cool the sea surface temperature um, just because it's going to be. Um, because of the convection. Um, and then as that movement of water progresses towards the um, Horde of Africa region, equatorial Africa, um, Western basin, we're going to see this cooler water pool there. So that's, that's our proposed mechanism at this point, at least. Um, and so with all of this, we think that, you know, we have this intense MJO phase the preconditions, this positive IOD event. Then we have this persistent MJO phase, phase as we saw um, the 
uh, sorry, the MJO phase one just pretty much hanging out in the um, Indian Ocean for all of July, hanging out right there in the center. And then in September as well, we see this, this um, MJO <laughs> stalling, I would guess I would say, um, in September as well over the Indian Ocean. And then we think that this combined with other um, inner basin interactions impacted the Pacific Ocean, which led to this triple year, three year long La Nina event. Um, so that's what we've observed and what we've been looking at into so far. We are also going to do some analysis of Rossby waves um, and that is still to come. Um, but yeah, that's, that's what we have. So we I kind of explained this a little bit, but we think that there was some, this intense MJO in the beginning in May, there was persistence in July, which led to strong IOD in September that lasted through November. Um, and so there was some interference or at least some sort of um, relationship between the IOD and the MJO that led to perhaps the, and well, this encouraged the La Nina event that started in 2020. Yeah. Thank you very much. But we have uh, questions. We're still working further for this interview. Have there a case for for this ongoing discussion that we have? People have been asking, you know, why this La Nina is so weird. Um, it's very rare to see a triple La Nina, and this one in particular didn't have an El Nino as a precursor. Mm -hmm. So this the community has been asking this question of what caused it. And then Hassan et al. McFadden is one of the clouds up there, suggested that it was because of the IOD. And mm -hmm. that gave us some pause. But it's still, you know, the IOD, I don't know if you have seen that paper by Goddard and Graham in 1999 that said that uh, there are doubts about the internal variability in the IOD because it doesn't have uh, the base in the Indian basin doesn't have a size to produce internal waves as spontaneously. So some people have been saying that there is no way the IOD can be independent of a mean. Mm -hmm. And now here they are suggesting that the IOD created a triple anemia. So mm -hmm. what the heck? So what created the the what started the IOD? And what Laurel has been suggesting is that uh, it was a uh, cross chain interference with phase one of the MJO, probably phase eight and one. So it's still working for but it seems that there is a uh, there is uh, evidence for that. And at EGU, we were talking to Eric Maloney. You know, he's an expert in the MJO. And actually, he suggested that it might be the MJO. But, you know, so this is evidence in that direction. It seems to be the first paper suggesting this MJO, IOD, triple anemia thing. And it's important to understand, which is what Laura is, is doing there. But I think that we are more interested even in the big thing. Because there is not such a prediction for an right. MJO IOD triple anemia. We couldn't predict this triple anemia at all. So, any questions online? Oh, yeah, please. Yeah. Has there been any special behavior of the MGO since the first event that could maintain this behavior of La Nina event all of these two years? Um, so, I haven't looked into how the beyond 2019. So I haven't looked into the MJO to see if it has persisted in phase one beyond the IOD event, um, but it's possible that it could have. But it, I'd, we're not sure if it's necessary. Like we believe it's like that relationship with the IOD okay. and the argument that the the um, Hassan et al. paper made was that it had to do with the Atlantic Nino that was happening in that Atlantic Ocean that really then combined with the IOD and formed the La Nina. So I don't know, but it's possible that the MJO could have been somehow involved to prolong, but we have not looked into to into like the tail like years after the it started. Yeah, yeah that's an interesting question. Like, yeah. it can maintain or has something to do with the yeah, we have been, you know, like they have signed on paper and what we have been doing is what started, but we haven't been seeing you know, what affected. Well, a little bit in our case, but it was, so can you, can you go back? Let me see if I understand this and you will see that I might. Where do you want me yeah, to? Uh, the Miller handles. 
So my interpretation, I don't know if this is yours, uh, Laurel, and everyone else, but my interpretation is that here we have two, two things. One is that size matters because in May, we only had four days, but it was pretty intense. And then in July, it's, it's not the size, it's the persistence. Yeah, amplitude so, versus persistence. So, so I think that what you're showing here is that it's a combination of these things, could be both, Correct. but the, the, the right intensity and the right at the right time and the right location with the right phase can create these things. Right. And, um, and I think, you know, as, as, as you know, like trying to find this type of precursor is very important when we are interested in prediction. Mm -hmm. And models are not still capturing this interaction very well. And I have looked into, so something similar happened in 2007, and I have started looking into what the MJO is doing at that time. And we do see that there was activity in phase one as well. And this um, coincided with a similar La Nina. So I think that there is some sort of relationship, but we're still looking into the um, into other like historical cases because there are very few. Um, I think Angel, you said something like three within the last fifty years La Ninas that are back to back. So this, this is the third one. Yeah, it's very rare. So sorry, I moved closer to to Laurel because uh, I I can see that you know, people couldn't hear me. So. I don't know if uh, I need to repeat anything or. But yeah, okay. So it seems that people are, can hear me now. So yeah, so I think that we do not know if this is going to be a more common behavior, having triple La Niñas, depending on where we are in the world, because everything that we do is demand driven. This has caused terrible losses, for example, in Colombia. Mm -hmm. So, so if we were able to forecast one La Nina, we can do that. You know, that is important for people, for society. But having a triple La Nina, like raining on land that is already wet because the previous year was already wet, that has been disastrous. So if this is going to continue because of climate change or natural climate variability or whatever that is, and we have a way to forecast these type of things, that will be important. But if it's coming, for example, some people have been mentioning to you that they thought that it came from noise. So out of a stochasticity, the IOD just got active. If that is the case, I have no idea how to forecast that. Right. But there is, if there is a forcing mechanism that we can forecast well, uh, then the story is completely different. Then we have predictive right. power. And if we can forecast the IOD, and the IOD can help us forecast, as it usually happens, uh, on El Nino, so then the story is different. So I think that there, are, there is a continuation paper here. Of course, Paco is asking, what caused the MJO in phase one? Which it seems related to your question. <laughs> right. So now we need to see what caused the MJO. Yeah, please. Sorry, I'm, having a, I'm trying to understand um, because the way the MJO might have interacted with La Nina in different months, the dynamics are completely different. For example, in May, and I'm just trying to understand exactly which process of in the tropical Pacific uh, has been mm. triggered by the MJO because in May, for example, in the Indian Ocean, this has nothing to do with the Pacific, isn't it? Yeah, no, but to trigger a La Nina and to accelerate the feedback process that the positive feedback that leads to the development of of a strong event or a persisting event. Um, Let's see. It, it really depends. So the interaction between between oceans, really, it really depends when it happens because if it happens in May, it's going to affect the decay phase and you have a very important contribution there in May yeah. that might not be, the mechanisms to trigger La Nina might not be the same as what you see in September that I would think like, okay, yeah, that's the growing state. That's, yeah. but then I don't, and, but you see both things more or less the same in May and September. So how, how did that, do you, do you yeah, understand? Yeah, I completely understand, but let me clarify something. We are not dealing here with La Nina. No, so we're in, this is the May happened during a long, or an El Nino event. So we see this decay of El Nino in May. Yeah. So it's possible that some sort of, some sort of MJO that was related to the El Nino decay. Um, I don't know, but this is in the Indian Ocean. So kind of, yeah. So the El Nino ended 
in August. We were in an El Nino phase, but the La Nina didn't start until um, 2020. This is 20. So yeah, yeah, this is 2019. So let, let's clarify something. So we are not saying that the IOD costs La Nina. Yeah. These guys said that. And yeah. it happens, you know, we're analyzing 2019. They are analyzing from 2021, the end of 2019, 2020, 2021, et cetera. Yeah. So they are in charge and they already did. We're just looking, yeah. So we're just looking at understanding why this IOD event formed and under the condition of an El Nino that was ending, why did it persist? They were describing how this whole process leads. So we're just trying to figure out the small piece of the puzzle here because they're just like, this is what happened. And we're like, well, how did the IOD happen to begin with? So I understand the question, sense. but you see that we are doing no analysis at all between the NJO and MENSO, zero. We're doing MJO and, then, yes. and IOD because they claim that that is the mechanism, that is a plausible mechanism between the IOD to produce a triple amine. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, am, I understand your point, okay. but I guess that I was just curious to know how the same mechanism can both contribute to a decay of the linea and then. Yeah, maybe we're doing a serial thing. We're thinking about a parallel additional interaction with the Pacific. But, yeah. but as you are saying, we didn't see a La Nina until later. Yeah. So whatever happened in just one or two months in terms of the IOD in the Indian Ocean, we couldn't see a, a, an impact in the Pacific until later. But I, you know, you have a really good point. Yesterday I talked about how MJO has a preference in different phases during different ENSO phases, right? So how do we see that impacting during the end of that El Nino event that finished in 2019 during part of this period, right? There, right? So we have this, this El Nino event and how is that impacting the MJO when it's or in phase one? Something. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a really good point. Yeah. So, so I, I can tell you, but when did La Nina started, like a whole year after that? Yeah, but we're in a positive ENSO phase here, right? So we see this interaction of ENSO's influence on the MJO in May and July, but that's different than, you know, this neutral condition that we see in September. Okay. Yeah, in October. So, yeah, that's really interesting. Really cool place. Anyway. There was an, a question online. Oh, um. Do you know what is the sea surface temperature spatial pattern of strong positive IOD? Do they all have this blue region? Uh, let's see. So the composites that were made here were um, only using the this threshold. Um, I don't have the threshold. I could raise the threshold for the IOD to make it the DMI index for positive, you know, above one, but I have not done that. But that's a really good question as well, like understanding if we see this, um, maybe a strengthening of this blue, I think is what you're referring to, if we see this blue here and what that means. Um, but I don't have that, but that's that's a good question. Any other questions? Yeah, very good. Okay. Here? This, yeah. So you you say that it is uh intense in the phase one and a no, where you have the circle. But then, uh, for instance, in the last the two that there is the green line that is also very uh, mm, far from the center in the phase seven and six, while you are not considering that or it is a different information. Um, no, I think that's a, that's a good question. Um, I haven't looked into, so eventually this, this dies, right? We see that the IOD dies here. And we had found that there was a negative correlation between the DMI index and, and MJO phase six. So it's possible that while the MJO was here in phase six, it started the demise of the IOD event. Um, but I have not looked into that. But yeah, it's a good point. We can take a look. Show, show the composites of phase six, six, and seven. She has a point there. Yeah. 
see, faces six and seven are actually destructive interference. Yeah. So the same framework can be used to talk about and to try to explain the demise of the IAD. That's right. And if we have that, so then hopefully, or apart from that, we might be able to have um, uh, some precursor to build a model for not only onset, but also demise of the IAD. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good one. Good Love question. Love it. So, you know, that your approach is showing how that That's might, right. might be. Because what's pretty tense and persistent. Sorry, I'm I'm trying to be loud so people online can hear. <laughs> oh, sorry. Odd wants to, uh, the current question repeated. Can you? Oh, the current the current question was, I'm oh, sorry, I should have repeated that. The current question was, we see here in, I can't make out, I think it's November. We see that towards the middle to end of November, the MJO is in phase six and seven. And um, the question was about understanding how if we were, we've been focused on, on phase one. And so understanding how can, are we considering when the MJO here is in phase six and seven? Um, and what does that mean? And how does that impact the IOD? And so then we went and looked at the composite analysis, which you all saw and saw that this phase six and seven um, is more destructive to the IOD. So it would suggest that we would likely see the demise of the IOD, which we did in November into December. So yeah, it's pretty cool. <laughs> Another question, yeah. like relating to this, the when you show the correlation uh, the data from each phase to the IOD, this one, like yeah, the confidence is really similar to the actual value of the correlation, right? Yes, but essentially the confidence limit of correlation is suggesting for around zero, um, if we're you know like how this is very close to this, right? Yeah. Um, so it's like positive, positive 0 0.99 and negative 0 0.99 and anything above or below those values would be significant. So you're, um, um, prioritizing the sign of the correlation yes, more so than the intensity. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Because, because with this kind of thing, this theorem, uh, you won't get like high correlation. What is, what she's trying to see is to answer the question of, it's, it's, it's that correlation different than zero. Okay. So you just need that to be different than yeah. zero. And it is, right? Very small, but it is. So the other way to do this, which I think is what you know, most people do, is a, a team student test saying uh, if the p value is less than 0 0.05, so then it is different than zero. So this is an equivalent way to do it. Okay. Because in this one, she's not assuming that it's a Gaussian distribution right. or anything. She's just going with the empirical PDF. Yeah. So, so you know, that thing says MJO phase eight and MJO phase one have correlations, uh, positive correlations, which is what we want for constructive interference with the IOD uh, that are so basic significant. That's what I was saying. I'm not saying a lot more. Yeah, it would be nice to see something in terms of the, not the phase, but the magnitude. To be able to say something about the magnitude of the IOD, we were talking about that today. Not the IOD, we were talking about every cancer. So we we have prediction systems like at the IRI to forecast if cancer is going to happen. But I don't know of any operational for the system for the magnitude of the meaning that is going to happen. Right. So I think that her question is related to that one. It's not about the phase one, it's about the magnitude. Right. It's a good, good thing also for prediction. Very good. Any other question online? Do you see any other question? I don't see any, no. Good. Excellent. So in 10 minutes, we have uh, answers. Um, goodbye. I don't have to say party, but um, there's a call. <laughs> so, so it's in the, in the terrace. So we still have a few minutes, but if there are no questions, we can we can just go there. And there are a lot of uh, things that you should try at some point That's today or tomorrow <laughs> before it gets uh, this bad. Yeah. All right, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Laurel. Very very nice. Thank yeah. you.
This is being saved on the next, every quarter. 